What are some of the most brazen robberies people will actually try to do? Let's find out, starting with number seven, in her uniform. Robin Connor was busted by her colleagues while she was trying to shoplift in uniform. Her uniform was a police uniform that she was wearing because she was an on-duty police officer. She was busted when an employee stopped her from walking out the front door in a pair of $140 tennis shoes. The employee then detained her and called 911. Connor's department, including her chief of police, responded to the call and arrested her at the store. She was booked and put in jail like any other normal shoplifter. The ironic thing is that she was arrested and brought to her precinct in the back of her patrol car. She was immediately put on leave, but a short while later, the city council unanimously decided to fire her. At that point, she had spent two years on the force and was somewhat working her way up the ladder. Connor was charged with misdemeanor shoplifting for stealing goods worth less than $1,000. In the end, her police chief said that Robin's behavior was deeply embarrassing and she would receive no courtesies as she moved through the justice system. All that effort just to become a cop and she threw it away over shoes? Number six, The Wreck. Jariah Terrell, Kanaya Williams, and an unnamed third woman caused a huge wreck after stealing from a retail store. Unfortunately for the three masked robbers, their robbing plans didn't quite go as expected. The plan was simple. Get into the retail store, rob it, get into a getaway car, and then ride off into the sunset. But that's not what ended up happening. The crew got to the store, stole some stuff worth around $5,000, and got into their getaway car, a 2018 Kia Optima, which is kind of a super weird choice for a getaway vehicle, right? But instead of driving off into the sunset, the gang was caught by police officers who noticed that their Kia Optima was speeding. Officers initially tried to conduct a traffic stop, but the driver of the vehicle, Terrell, decided not to stop, which obviously led to a police chase. At some point, the officers realized that the gang was determined not to stop as they had run several red lights, so the chase was terminated. No reason to risk everyone else's safety when there are other ways to pursue the shoplifters. The ladies didn't stop until the vehicle hit a 2012 GMC Sierra. Now their escape vehicle was terminated. One of the gang members, who remains unnamed, was seriously injured after the crash. She ended up on a fence impersonating a scarecrow, if you get the picture. And despite the injury, Terrell, the driver of the vehicle, still tried to drive away, repeatedly jamming her foot on the gas pedal, even though the car was obviously no longer working. This just shows you how determined criminals can be even in the face of insurmountable odds such as a seriously injured friend and a totaled vehicle. Just hearing about that kind of determination really makes us feel like we can tackle the day, you know? Like, if petty criminals can do it, maybe, just maybe, we can too. The good news is that while the driver of the GMC was hurt, they're going to be fine. In the end, the police found that all three members of the gang have extensive criminal history. They have now all been arrested and have all been held on a $350,000 bond. Bond. Judging from their criminal history, they will most likely cool their heels in jail for a really long time. On the next shoplifting spree, we're sure there'll be more, maybe don't just automatically start speeding if no one is chasing you. It seems like the police tend to notice it, and they get mad or whatever. Number five, hotel stripping. You know how everyone is always stealing hotel towels? Well, an unnamed couple stayed in a hotel and stole everything in the room. The Dolphin Hotel and Restaurant said that the two robbers seemed like pleasant people when they first checked in, but they left after only one night at the hotel. It was only after they had stripped the room of all it had that the owners of the hotel realized what happened. The funny thing is that the couple arrived with only a small overnight bag, but they left with much more. They stole so much that when they were leaving, they had to make multiple trips to their car to pack all their loot. The owners of the 80 pound a night hotel only notified the police when they checked the room the couple had vacated and found it stripped bare. The robbers had stolen everything they could carry. This included a kettle, luxury towels, a lamp, the tea and coffee container, a charging tower, and every other valuable that could leave the room. The items stolen from the hotel will cost well over 200 pounds to replace. This means the hotel cannot rent the place out before that's done. The worst part about the crime is that it 
happened at a point where the hotel was facing really tough times due to the cost of living crisis. The owners said they tried contacting the number the couple left, but as you'd expect, the number wasn't valid. The hotel owners also sent messages and have even tried charging their debit card, but the transaction declined. The only good thing is that the identity of the thieves was caught on CCTV camera, and the hotel owners have now released pictures of the thieves to the public. The thing that's weird though is that it's like a nice hotel, but not that nice. The place looks more like an Airbnb than a hotel, and while it doesn't look cheap, you'd more expect this from a place like the Plaza or something, not a quaint hotel in Wales. We won't tell you where we stay, but we will say that there are two trees involved. We miss you, Mitch. Number four, the driver. Kim Kardashian chauffeur Michael Madar has been arrested as part of the 17 suspects involved in the armed robbery that happened to her in Paris back in 2016. And that arrest has some people claiming that the robbery might have been an inside job all along. The armed robbers got into her hotel room during Fashion Week, tied her up, and made away with over 10 million in jewelry. It was the biggest robbery involving a private citizen in Paris in over 20 years. Kim said she didn't know Madar personally and that he he was her chauffeur only because he worked for an upmarket firm that was used by the Kardashian family whenever they were in Paris. Always using the same company meant that Madar would know about all Kim's movements and would know exactly when her security architecture was vulnerable to a theft. So he knew that the right time to go after Kim was when her bodyguard, Pascal Duvier, was at a nightclub with Kim's sisters. The police were able to track down the criminals through a DNA match from a necklace and the duct tape used to gag Kim. Through that lead, they were able to trace the ringleader of the gang, Omar 8 Kadash, an elderly man who lives in a villa in the south of France. Most of the suspects were around 50 to 60 years old, which was weird since it seems like most armed criminals busting into hotel rooms to rob self-important socialites tend to be in their 20s or their 30s. Also, all the arrested suspects are well known to the police, so they have a pretty long criminal history. Unfortunately, the police didn't find the looted jewelry with the criminals. What they found instead were weapons and lots of cash. So what do you think? Was the robbery an inside job or was it just a coincidence? We were just happy that the family recovered. They go through a lot, you know. It's tough being ultra famous and out of touch. Number three, pepper sprayed. Toucan the Tran is her name, and pepper spraying jewelry store staff and stealing golden chains is her game. Her other game was probably Candy Crush or something, but her main game in this story is pepper spraying and stealing. Tran went to a jewelry store to carry out her thieving plans around 5 p.m. with a heavy disguise. She was wearing sunglasses and a broad-brimmed sun hat that hid her face. She also had a blonde wig, making it nearly impossible for anyone to recognize her. Once in the store, Tran asked a staff member to see a tray of jewelry. She was also pretending to be blind, so she had to feel the jewelry. Clever girl. The jewelry was brought out, and that's when Tran brought a small cylinder out of her purse and pepper sprayed the store staff. She then picked up the jewelry, worth about $17,000, and vamoosed. The store attendant tried to pursue her, but Tran was surprisingly quick, despite all her disguises. But Tran's getaway wasn't perfect. The thief dropped both the pepper spray she had used on the store attendant and a taser as well. She also dropped some of the jewelry she had planned on stealing. And Tran didn't just lose her trusty pepper spray and taser either. She also lost her freedom. Tran was arrested just feet outside the jewelry store after the owner caught her and can hope to have a permanent residence in prison for a few years. She's been charged with aggravated robbery, possessing a prohibited weapon, and being in breach of bail. Disappointingly, she didn't show up to court in her disguise. Number two, a casual Apple store theft. A thief casually strolled into an Apple Apple store and ripped a whole display of Apple iPhones off the store wall in what some are saying is the most relaxed case of theft they have ever seen. Both shoppers and the store attendants simply just watched and filmed as the masked felon committed the crime. After cramming about 49 phones into his pockets, the criminal casually walked out of the store as easily as he had walked in. Afterwards, the shocking video of the incident was posted on social media. The most interesting thing about the
the video is the fact that nobody even tried to interfere with the robbery. But that's actually store policy. According to online sources, Apple employees are instructed not to interfere with ongoing robberies. This is because they don't want to escalate the situation by making it even worse. There's also the matter of Apple being liable for injuries or harm suffered by its employees if they are sustained while stopping a robbery. One way Apple tries to reduce robbery incidents at its stores by keeping its stock in a private restricted area that's open only to employees. That's probably why a lot of robbers that target Apple are only able to get away with the demo phones that are sitting on display. The demo phones on display are also usually disabled, which means they aren't quite as useful as regular iPhones since they don't have the same capabilities. However, this doesn't mean they are useless to a potential thief. The phones can still be useful because of their parts, which can be used for other iPhones, which is why this sort of theft has become popular. According to the police, several robberies like this have started happening in the Oakland area. Like, Oakland needs more crime. A thief previously snatched 40 devices from a store in Berkeley, and that same store was robbed of phones worth up to $29,000. That same store was robbed by another bunch of thieves, and they stole 16 iPhones before leaving. So it's basically been a bonanza for thieves in Northern California. But it doesn't look like Apple's store policy is changing anytime soon. However, the police haven't been completely sitting on their hands concerning the robberies. One suspect in this spate of robberies, Dwayne Butler II, has now been arrested and is being held on an $80,000 bond. But drastic changes have to be made if these robberies are to be prevented in the future. Ironically, all these robberies happened at a time when the government of California is trying desperately to reduce crime by increasing the number of California Highway Patrol officers deployed to the area. What do you think? Do you live in the Bay Area? How's it been? Because it sounds like it's turning into Mad Max. Let us know in the comment section. And if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how this guy was able to defeat facial recognition. Number one, the cleaning. Alistair and Sue Connor were shocked when they discovered that their cleaner had been stealing their property while pretending to perform a deep clean. And to make things worse, this didn't happen at home. Instead, it happened when the couple were on vacation in Spain with their teenage son at the four-star Magic Natura Resort in Benidorm. Benidorm, for the uninitiated, is a popular coastal tourist spot, something like going to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, or Panama City, Florida for the Brits. The family paid 5,500 pounds for an all-inclusive vacation package, but it must have included some hidden fees because they were somehow getting robbed every time they went out. The couple began noticing the thefts on the very first day they arrived at the resort. Little things like cigarettes, perfumes, and small cash started missing. Sue also realized that hands had been in her underroo drawers, which is really gross. Her son reported that his golden pendant had been stolen too, but the Connors really couldn't put a finger on who exactly was doing the stealing. So they tried to set up cameras in their rooms to catch the thief, but the cameras didn't have a long-lasting battery. Then they tried taking pictures of their valuables before leaving the room, and that's when they got substantial proof that someone was robbing them. However, they wouldn't get video footage until the end of their vacation. Alistair got the idea to use his laptop to record the room while they went out, and that's when he got the footage of their cleaner rummaging through their room looking for things to steal. In the end, they realized that around 630 pounds worth of items had been stolen stolen from them by the cleaner. The owners of the hotel put out a statement saying disciplinary measures had been taken and Jet2, the company they had booked their holiday through, offered the Connors a refund of 630 pounds. However, the Connors decided that their entire holiday was ruined and they won't accept anything less than a full refund. Fair enough, right? Who are some of the somewhat smart criminals who actually at least took the time to plan their crimes? Let's check them out, starting with... Number seven, cardboard recognition. An unnamed thief in Brazil used his victim's photos to scam the facial recognition systems of online banking apps. The man manipulated an online banking app's facial recognition login option by placing customer photos on a dummy to access their accounts and take out loans. Since he had their images, he didn't need people's login information. Instead, the man selected the Face ID option and placed a cell phone in front of the dummy, allowing him access to their accounts. Investigators uncovered the operation and apprehended him at his home. During their raid, they discovered stacks of photos of his victims, 
17 card machines, and a safe where he stored counterfeit cards and the cell phone he used to access people's accounts. Officers created a reenactment video to demonstrate how his scam worked. They positioned the photos on the dummy and proved that, at the right angle, facial recognition apps believed the images were real people. The scammer took out multiple loans once he gained access to people's accounts, but the amount he stole is unknown. It makes you wonder if he ever sat all the dummies around a table and had a tea party or something. Like he's Will Smith in I Am Legend. Number 6. Fake it till you make it. Eric Gutierrez deceived casino owners out of over $1 million when he pretended to be the Circa Hotel and casino owner. An unknown man contacted Circa's casino cage, which is where a casino keeps the cash, casino chips, credit chips, and other documentation, claiming to be the hotel's owner. The fake casino owner claimed they needed $320,000 for an emergency payment to the fire department. He then claimed they needed to make payments for new equipment. The cage supervisor met with Gutierrez off-site, believing he was the hotel owner's lawyer to give him payments of $314,000, $350,000, and $500,000. She also approved three smaller deposits, handing Gutierrez a total of $1,170,000. Why she didn't think the whole situation was fishy is beyond us. Someone is shady. The police tracked down the car Gutierrez drove to pick up the money and discovered it belonged to his aunt, who he lived with. When law enforcement searched the home, they found large bags of $850,000 in cash with Circa written on them. Authorities arrested and charged Gutierrez with theft. Upon his arrest, authorities discovered he was also facing charges for his involvement in a previous scam. Investigators were unable to locate the remaining $314,000. This was clearly not a well-thought-out plan on the part of Gutierrez, since he was caught before he even got the money out of the bags at his aunt's house. But we bet that somewhere, there's a former cage supervisor sipping mojitos on a beach. Number 5. Dama No Pizza For You Scammers deceived pizza lovers across Australia into ordering dinner on a fake Domino's website. The fraudsters created a Domino's page similar to the pizza chain's website, and few people noticed the subtle differences between the two. Although it replaced the I with a J in the website domain, and and didn't give the option to pay in store, many victims didn't think anything was wrong. To be fair, how many people actually double check a website's name over a low ticket item such as pizza? The page was one of the first results when people googled Domino's and one potential customer almost ordered from the phony website. He selected a few pizzas and when he went to pay, he realized there was no option to pay via PayPal, which is what Domino's actual page offers. The would-be victim looked at the address and noticed that Domino's was spelt with a J replacing the I and took to Facebook to warn others about the scam. Customers noticed that when they entered the website, it didn't record their regular orders. Some switched to the app, which took them to the real company website. But not everyone caught the scam before paying. One woman lost $800 when she accidentally ordered on the site. She didn't receive her pizza that night, and more importantly, there was no sign she would get her money back. Domino's wasn't the only company that scammers targeted. A woman that thought she ordered from an Australian clothing store called Peter Alexander. The transaction was normal until she received a strange confirmation email and realized they had taken more from her account than the order cost. Another person went to order from an outlet store when they noticed that PayPal wasn't a payment option. Upon closer looking at the web address, they discovered that the number zero replaced the letter O. Sneaky. The problem has become so common in Australia that Shoppers are taking precautions to avoid giving money to scammers. And even though this happens more commonly in Australia, it could also easily happen in the US. Consumers suggest having a separate bank account only for online shopping, which they transfer money into as they buy things. Which seems like a lot of extra work, even though it's sensible. Shout out in the comments if you do this. Since scammers often push their URLs to get to the top on search engine results, checking the web page to ensure accuracy is crucial. Scam Watch, run by the Australian government, has a section on its website Site dedicated to this popular trick used by scammers. A standard red flag includes asking you to pay with a money order, preloaded money card, or wire transfer rather than a secure payment service like PayPal or a credit card transaction. Which should be a red flag to everyone, right? Who'd go buy a preloaded money card just to buy a pizza? Some fraudsters advertise products at unbelievably low prices and have deals you can only access if you pay up front and through their preferred payment methods. When scammers sell items on social
social media, they likely have limited delivery and policy information. They also probably won't provide information about privacy, terms, and conditions of use, contact details, and return information. It makes sense that the scammers targeted Domino's and not Little Caesars, since the scammers wanted to actually make money. Just kidding, we love Little Caesars too. Number four, Versace on the floor. A con man approached Australian retiree Ian Sutton in his front yard and convinced him to pay $550 for a fake Versace leather jacket. Sutton was gardening in his front yard when a man in a white vehicle drove down his street. The driver called over to Sutton, claiming to be lost and needing directions to the airport. We guess he didn't have a cell phone? After Sutton gave him directions, the driver told him that he worked for Versace and had just visited Australian luxury department stores David Jones and Grace Brothers. In exchange for his help, the driver offered Sutton a leather jacket worth thousands of dollars at a great price. The interaction was quick, and before Sutton could give it any thought, he had handed over $500 for what he thought were four designer jackets. But the deal seemed too good to be true, and when the retiree got home, he researched and discovered that the driver was a scammer. Sutton wasn't the only person to fall for the scam. As Ange Marinakis drove around Melbourne, two men pulled up beside him and asked for directions to the airport. After he pointed them in the right direction, one of the smooth-talking good looking young men explained that they were leaving a fashion show and offered him a Versace jacket for his kindness. Marinakis accepted the jacket, but one of the men said he wanted to buy his son a gift at the airport but had no cash. After being given such an expensive item, Marinakis felt obliged to hand over $400, but the men were unsatisfied with the amount. So they forced him to withdraw more cash from a nearby ATM, and by the end of his interaction with the fraudsters, Marinakis had given them $900. When Marinakis returned home, he inspected the jacket and discovered that it was a fake. The scammers also lured Michael Manning with a luxury leather jacket. A man named Ciro Gallo approached Manning and offered him the expensive clothing item. Like the other victims, when Manning accepted it, Gallo asked for payment. Manning helped lead the police to Gallo, who arrested him for selling Manning the fake jackets. Gallo pleaded guilty to three offenses and received a $5,000 fine. The judge also ordered that he pay $10,000 in compensation to his victims. The scam sounds so believable though, doesn't it? We'd completely fall for it too. Number three, the ATM heist. Over three hours, an international crime ring with almost 100 members stole millions of yen from Japanese ATMs back in 2016. The criminals targeted ATMs across Tokyo, Aichi, Osaka, Kanagawa, Fukuoka, and 16 other locations. The gang conducted their operation on a Sunday morning in May 2016, using counterfeit credit cards containing information leaked by South Africa's Standard Bank. The operation occurred on a Sunday morning when banks were closed. During that time, they they visited 1,400 convenience store ATMs, and after three hours, they had stolen roughly $17 million. It wasn't clear how they got their hands on so much cash since most ATMs in the country only allow deposits of $900 a day. Japanese authorities worked with South African authorities through Interpol to track the thieves. With the help of security camera footage, Aichi police located and arrested two men, Tatsuo Nakazono and Katsuya Sahachi, in connection with the operation. The men visited two convenience stores and used fake credit cards with the names of men from Zimbabwe and South Africa. They acted on behalf of an acquaintance who paid them a few thousand dollars. By the time law enforcement found them, they had already passed around $9,000. Police believe they had another $19,000 in their possession. Investigators located an additional four men who visited five convenience stores between them in Ichihara City, an area east of Tokyo. One of the men was Takanari Fukada, a member of a Yakuza group affiliated with the Yamaguchi Gumi, Japan's largest organized crime operation. Despite Fukuda's affiliations, the Yakuza wasn't involved in the ATM heists. The four men couldn't give the police the information they were looking for as they were low-level members of the gang without any authority. It's impressive, though, that they only caught six people out of over 100. It's not like ATM aren't found in public places with cameras everywhere. Six out of 100 is almost the statistical equivalent of saying the police got lucky. Number two, the scam of Khan. Muhammad Khan offered vulnerable victims tax breaks to access their bank details. During the COVID-19 lockdown, Khan sent thousands of emails and texts that pretended to offer tax breaks. He copied official UK government communications to make his communications look legitimate. Khan preyed upon people who feared for their jobs, homes, and abilities to support themselves financially. Some victims were also dealing with contracting the coronavirus or worrying about loved ones who had. Khan's communications included a fraudulent website link where victims 
victims entered their details and passwords, handing him all their banking information. He passed his victims' details and templates for fraudulent websites via WhatsApp to other scammers. At the time, Khan, a university student, lived with his parents and siblings at his family home in Northwest London. He had run several other sophisticated scams since 2017 and saw an opportunity when the COVID-19 lockdown happened in March 2020. Victims contacted the government about the fraudulent texts and the dedicated payment unit of the London Police Department opened an investigation into the phishing campaign. Khan's defense argued that he resorted to crime due to poverty. He shared a two-bedroom apartment with his two siblings and looked after his sick 10-year-old brother in the evenings. The promising student did well in all his exams before entering university and studied politics and international relations at Queen Mary University. But the judge didn't believe that Khan was a victim in this situation and highlighted that he'd committed fraud and preyed upon the elderly and other vulnerable people who suffered greatly due to his actions. Khan pleaded guilty to fraud by false representation and possessing an article for use in fraud. He received 30 weeks in jail for each offense. Number one, can you hear me now? Ross Folks thought he had created an untraceable scam until London police exposed his fraud and sentenced him to jail. Alongside fellow scammers Mark Thompson and David Robinson, Folks purchased Voice Over Internet Protocol Airtime, known as VoIP, software that enables people to make calls over the internet instead of a landline. The trio acquired Voice Over Internet Protocol Airtime from major telecommunications companies like British Telecom BT, Wavecrest, and the Exclusive Group. The scammers then sold abroad through a company they had taken over called CADCorp. The scammers used their own engineer to make the source of the calls untraceable. Clients then used their phone service to make international calls from the UK to places like Zimbabwe and Middle Eastern countries. Folks' operation generated $1.25 million, which he spent as quickly as he made it. He splurged on Porsches and Ferraris while eating out at London's most exclusive restaurants and booking rooms at luxury hotels. Folks showcased his lavish lifestyle on his Instagram account, where he had a following of over 36,000. The three men thought their scam was untraceable. They could spend over a million dollars of another company's money without ever having to repay it. However, the City of London's police fraud squad specializes in investigating complex fraud cases and soon uncovered their telecom scam. Also, they would inevitably be caught when they attempted to defraud an organization as large as BT because, of course, we can't have wealthy corporations getting victimized now, can we? BT's threat intelligence and GES Transformation Department worked with the City of London Police Fraud Squad to uncover the scam and arrest Folks. Folks received a three-year jail sentence after appearing before the Inner London Crown Court, while Thompson received a four-year sentence. Robinson fled to Thailand after his arrest. The court found him guilty in his absence and sentenced him to five years in prison. At least Robinson is fully capable of keeping in contact with friends and family. Click here to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have. Free health care for life or $100,000 cash.